Hi, Mystery Recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain an American horror anthology film called Nightmare Cinema. Spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. At the start of the movie, a girl named Samantha is walking down the streets at night. As she reaches a theater named The Rialto, she notices that it is showing the movie The Thing in the Woods with her name below it. Taken aback, she decides to enter the theater and watch the movie. Soon, Samantha sees a bloodied version of herself running away from someone in the woods. That someone is revealed to be The Welder, a giant butcher with a metal mask over his face. As Samantha runs for her life, she trips over a dead corpse, which almost gives her a heart attack. Fortunately, her boyfriend, Jason, arrives at the scene and pulls her aside. They then escape from the place before the welder can get to them. After hours of running, they finally reach the road and see a vehicle approaching them. Jason immediately asks for a lift, and luckily, it turns out to be a police car. A chubby-looking cop emerges and asks the couple why the girl is covered in blood. When Jason explains everything, he finally agrees to give them a lift. But before they can leave, the welder arrives in front of them. The cop Cop gets out of the car and shoots at the giant multiple times, causing him to drop to the floor. However, when he proceeds to the car, he accidentally trips and shoots himself, blowing his brains out. Hmm, smoked bacon. The welder also gets up and starts chasing after the couple. In the next scene, they arrive at one of their friends, Mike's house. The latter is confused seeing their condition, so Samantha explains everything. Right then, the welder arrives outside and throws a hammer, knocking Mike to the ground. When the welder tries to enter inside, Jason blocks the door and takes the shotgun off the wall to shoot him. His attempts fail as the welder breaks the door and enters the house before stabbing Mike with a weapon. Jason shoots him, but the welder uses Mike as a shield and manages to save himself. When one of the bullets hits Mike's head, it bursts into pieces, splattering blood everywhere. Terrified of what she just saw, Samantha quickly runs off to the basement. Following that, Jason starts fighting the welder, trying to use a knife against him. However, the welder manages to stab him with it. He is then burned to death death with a flaming tool. Samantha enters the basement at the same time and yells in terror at finding mutilated corpses inside. Hearing her boyfriend's last scream, she accepts her fate and decides to die fighting rather than running. She emerges from the basement, intending to kill the welder, and attacks him. Surprisingly enough, she overpowers him easily. Seconds before the welder is killed, his mask comes off. As it turns out, the killer is none other than Samantha's friend, Fred. Upon being asked what's going on, Fred says, me and Scoob and the gang always took the masks off. I wanted to wear one. But actually, Fred urges her to remember what happened last weekend. The scene then shifts to a week ago, when Samantha and her friends came to the woods for a night out. They get along well, like normal people. In contrast to their situation a few minutes ago, things are going well, until suddenly, they notice something big falling from the sky. Jason takes it as an opportunity to explore the woods and add to their adventure. In the next hour, the group sets off to look for the object that fell, and finds that it has made an impact on the ground. A curious Jason touches the mass, causing a massive number of spiders to emerge and chase the group. Everyone freaks out and tries running away, but strangely enough, the spiders pursue the group and enter their bodies in a horrifying way. It turns out that after they take over a person's body, the insects are able to control them. Soon, everyone except Fred is taken over by the spiders. He somehow manages to reach the cabin and decides that he will kill his friends to stop the spiders from spreading their terror. He strategically suits himself with the welding garment and starts killing all of his friends. Back in the present, Samantha remembers everything, including how the spider got into her body. Just when the realization hits her, her skull splits open, revealing a spider hiding inside. Fred immediately grabs an axe and hits her dead. However, when he walks out of the house, a large swarm of spiders surrounds him. In the following scene, we see Fred driving a car heading toward the nearest city. Movements can be seen inside his skull, which makes it clear he has also been possessed by the spiders. The next story is about a young couple, David and Anna. One night, they decide to sneak into an empty theater to make love. This turns out to be the same theater Samantha was at. Suddenly, the screen lights up and the couple is shown a movie starring themselves. Anna and David are enjoying dinner at a restaurant as they normally would, but in this movie, Anna has a slight scar on her cheek. Although David assures her she is pretty, she is insecure because of the scar. To help her confidence, David 
but offers to pay for her plastic surgery. Wow, he 180'd on that fast. He talks about his mother, who has had several works done to her face and thinks that it is completely normal. Clearly, his mother hasn't seen Simon Cowell lately. The very next day, Anna is at the clinic, where Dr. Leaner is checking her scar. The doctor confirms that the plastic surgery will remove 95% of the scar, and Anna happily agrees to go through with the procedure. Soon, Anna is sedated, and the doctor works his magic on her. While sleeping, she dreams of walking to David at her wedding. But when she reaches the altar, she finds Dr. Leaner and the nurses carrying bloody tools. Afraid, Anna wakes up to see the nurse and David staring at her face, which is now bandaged. Because of the medicine, Anna soon falls asleep, and David takes the opportunity to snap pictures of her. After Anna wakes up, she asks the nurse for a mirror, but the nurse rejects her request and does not allow her to make any phone calls either. Anna thinks it is strange that she is being isolated from the world and decides to get out of her room to investigate. She finds the nurse's computer and skims through it to find some strange facts about the surgery performed on her. Before she can look any further, the nurse returns. Samantha decides to flee, but on her way, she notices someone asking for help from inside a room. She goes in and is horrified to find a woman whose eyes and nose have been surgically cut out, making her look inhumane. This is the kind of thing you accidentally see on TV as a kid and it scars you for life. Afraid, Anna tries to run away but gets noticed by the nurse. She manages to knock the nurse out and get into the elevator, but when it stops, the doctor is waiting for her outside. They forcefully sedate her and bring her back to the operating table to perform yet another surgery on her. In the next scene, we see Anna waking up beside David. She takes off her bandages and tries to look at herself in the mirror, and to her horror, she no longer looks anything like herself. Her facial structure has changed. She has several scars on it, and her nose has been half removed. Samantha screams out loud while David's mother comes into the room and compliments her looks. The scene abruptly changes back to the theater, where Anna is now alone. Alone. She walks around and bumps into the projectionist, who explains to her that the movie is actually about her worst nightmare. The scene ends as Samantha screams out loud. The third story in the series also starts outside the same theater. A church's father, named Benedict, enters the theater upon seeing his name displayed outside. He is asked to sit down and shown a movie about his church. Then, we are introduced to a possessed boy named Peter, standing on the church's roof. He acts erratic and threatens to jump. A nun frantically approaches Peter and tries to stop him. She eventually convinces him, and Peter tries to hold her hand. However, before he is able to do so, the evil spirit throws him off the roof. Blood splatters everywhere, shocking the people who witnessed the incident. At night, one of Peter's friends, Danny, is mourning his death, while her mother tries to console the traumatized girl. Somewhere else, we see Father Benedict and the nun making love against the rules of the church. At least she's of age. That's a win for any church. Suddenly, they hear a noise nearby and go out to investigate. Investigate. To their shock, they are welcomed by blood marks all around the church. The next day, Danny is bullied by one of her friends at church. She tries to defend herself, which causes the bully to be attacked by a strange force. Just when everyone is wondering what happened, the girl notices a devil-like creature standing behind Danny's mom. Later at night, all the girls are possessed by an evil spirit. The nun, trying to find a way out of this, reads a book about the devil. She concludes that they are being attacked by a devil named Mashit. Mashit? don't stank. She tries to convey the message to the father, but at the same time, Peter's spirit arrives and informs them that the devil is someone they know. The father and the nun believe that the evil spirit is inside Danny, so they decide to perform an exorcism on her before it's too late. When they try to do so, Danny's mom intervenes and takes her away from them. Later, the father realizes that the devil has been inside Danny's mom all along. In the next scene, Danny's mom enters the girl's living quarters and tortures every girl. The father and the nun run to the room and notice Danny Danny's mouth is closed with stitches. Soon, the children, under the influence of the devil, start attacking them. The father and the nun try to defend themselves by carrying a sword and reluctantly kill some of the children, but they come back to life and brutally kill the father. Meanwhile, Danny's mom climbs to the rooftop and is ready to throw herself off. The nun tries to stop her from taking her life, but Danny's mother grabs her and both fall down to their doom. Danny's mother passes away, but the nun is somehow still alive. It is then revealed that the evil spirit has possessed the nun now. Danny's mom has passed the devil on. The scene shifts back to the theater, where the father sits terrified. The projectionist appears behind him, strikes him hard, and kills him. The next story is about a woman named Helen, who also enters the theater. In her movie, she is inside a hospital with her sons, who continuously mock her. Helen takes a look around the hospital and finds everything strange, given her degrading mental health. Later, when she meets with the doctor, she tries to explain the strange environment around her, but 
but is interrupted by an emergency call from the doctor's assistant. The doctor then urges Helen to meet him the next day. After leaving the room unwillingly, Helen starts panicking upon not seeing her sons around. She looks for them everywhere while asking the staff, but no one seems to give her the attention she needs. Frustrated, Helen takes out a pistol from her bag and tries to shoot herself. Seconds before she pulls the trigger, she hears her son's voice outside and follows it. She notices the shadows of the doctor and her sons on the other side of the door. They are talking about her ill condition and how the only solution to help her would be to get her to commit the unthinkable. They also mention that they have provided her with a gun that has one bullet for this exact purpose. When the doctor says that Helen is listening to their conversation, she approaches them and shoots the doctor right into his head. Following that, she drags her sons away from the place to take them home. The scene then shifts to the theater, where Helen finds a gun inside her bag once again. Her story ends as we hear a gunshot, indicating that she finally did the deed. Or maybe she shot that dirty projectionist. The last story is about a young boy named Riley. He is listening to music while walking down a street at night, when he notices the theater. Unaware of the horror inside, he goes in and watches a movie about himself. In the movie, he is a famous penis, a pianist, and is playing the piano in front of a huge crowd. His proud parents are in the audience, enjoying their son's show. After the performance, the family is in their car when a stranger emerges from the back seat and holds Riley at gunpoint. He orders the parents to get out of the car and kneel down. When Riley's father retaliates, the kidnapper shoots him and his mother. Riley tries to run away, but he is also shot by the kidnapper. In the next scene, we see Riley waking up inside a hospital, traumatized by what happened to his parents. The doctor avoids any questions he asks about his parents, which annoys the kid. While in the hospital, Riley witnesses bizarre things going on around him. A few hours later, he is visited by the kidnapper, who pretends to be his family. Just as he is about to kill the boy, a nurse arrives and asks him to come back the next day. Later, Riley meets another patient named Casey, and as they chat, we get to know that they can see dead people. There's Bruce Willis right over there. The next day, Riley has a vision of his mother, asking him to come get her. She wants her son to die so she could get to be with him in the afterlife. Casey intervenes in their conversation and asks the woman to let Riley live. She tells Riley to stay strong and not fall for his mother's words and walks away. Not long after, Riley's mother kills the girl. Later that night, the kidnapper comes to Riley again and attempts to kill him for the third time. The kid somehow manages to get away and hide inside one of the morgue containers with Casey's corpse. He only gets out of the container after several minutes, thinking that he is safe, but as it turns out, the kidnapper is still looking for him. All of a sudden, Riley gets another vision of his mother, asking him to give up. Simultaneously, Casey suggests he fight back and live. Riley listens to Casey and stabs the kidnapper with a stick right through his neck to kill him. When everything ends, Riley is being escorted to his room when the dead kidnapper yet again appears in front of him. The scene then shifts to the theater, where Riley sits, scared of what he just saw. The projectionist comes to him and asks him to run, if he wants to save his life. He also reveals that all the previous participants are dead. In the final scene, the projectionist places Riley's tape on a shelf. As the camera zooms out, we see the shelf contains a large number of such boxes. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.